continuing series on prayer, and I hope that it's been helpful to you, that you find it edifying. Uh, we're, what we've been doing is looking through the Bible, building up, uh, looking at the idea of prayer, building a foundation, and so uh, we'll, we'll try to hit some major points tonight, uh, and then in subsequent one or two sessions, uh, really focus on the practical application uh, with a focus on what we do here on Wednesday nights and the weekly prayer meeting. So, um, you know, given the prayer request tonight, just there, Holly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just look at Brother Brian go up or down back there in the back. Yeah. He's good. <laughs> I like it because we can hear you good. Oh, is that it? Well, I'll, I'll tune on it a little bit. If you want down, I'll turn it down. I'll, I'll just deal with the echo. It sounds like I want to holler too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, given the nature of the prayer request tonight, uh, I'd like you, if you would, to look with me in the book of James, James chapter 5. If you recall, we were thinking about the who, what, where, when, why, and then eventually how of prayer. Um, last time we, we looked at the uh, Magnificat of Mary, uh, and that is a form of prayer Formed by scripture. And so we're going to continue our thoughts tonight about why we ought to pray. Amen. James chapter 5, and we're looking at uh, verses 13 through 16. So if you remember, um, one of the last points about uh, why we ought to pray is that we are not convincing God to change his mind or his purposes or his plan. Uh, but our prayers do change things. Our prayers do change events. Uh, so here in James chapter 5, let's look at verses 13 through 16. These are the words of God. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Now, if you remember, singing psalms, praying, it's the same thing, right? It's all part of worship. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And we also know that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, there in verse 16. Okay? So, now you have to be careful with the book of James, okay? Because James will say some things, and, and you think about James as the New Testament version of Proverbs, right? These are, these are good rules to go by. Uh, but they are not sort of absolute, specific, every situation, this is the way it's going to turn out, okay? Because we know that uh, we can pray for the sick, all right, and with, in, our, in our heart. Um, and this is a reminder that maybe we should be specific when we pray, right? Amen. Be very specific. Think about what does God want to accomplish in this situation, okay? God works all things <laughs> to the good for those who love him. So we want to ask God, what do you want to happen in this sickness, in this situation? All right, And we want to line up our will with his will. And we do that in prayer. All right? So that being said, uh, we pray for the sick in the hopes that they get better. But maybe the Lord is trying to teach us something in this situation. Maybe he's trying to uh, test or try the afflicted and accomplish something there. So we need to be sensitive to that. All right? We need not be discouraged that every time we pray for somebody who is sick, uh, that when they don't get immediately better, that there's not an immediate miraculous healing, that it's more of a process, um, that God is not answering our prayers. All right? We should maintain our hope in the Lord, and we should not be discouraged. All right? So James is kind of full of these short aphorisms, all right? And, um, and so they're not absolute guarantees um, that sickness, much less death, are going to be avoided 
every single time, perpetually, every time we pray. Okay? Uh, this is a concept uh, in medicine that I have a, a challenging time getting across to medical students because they come in and what's the purpose of medicine? Uh, well, to prevent death. Now, who can prevent death? <laughs> Nobody, right? It was, it's the height of arrogancy to think that we as physicians uh, can prevent death, right? God may use us uh, to, to prolong it, right? Hopefully not hasten it, uh, but he's, gonna, he's sovereign. He's going to work it out in his time. Um, and what we can hope for, though, is the resurrection, right? We, we <laughs> will all die, but we're not going to prevent that. Uh, but our hope is in the resurrection. Amen. So, um, the prayer of faith, okay, that effectual, uh, fervent prayer, the prayer of faith, as, as James is talking about in verse 15, that is not a name it and claim it type of faith healing, right? That just because uh, I utter the words and I say in Jesus' name that we're going to see this miraculous healing, right? Now, there are some of our uh, brethren and other denominations, they totally do believe that, right? And um, and what they do with the discouragement when it doesn't happen immediately, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not in that camp. Um, but it uh, it'd be interesting to talk to them about that. Now, notice it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So this is not the casual cavalier prayer um, of just you know putting it out there. Uh, really, there, this denotes some degree of passion, right? And the passion should be in proportion to the need and the seriousness of the request, of the petition. Uh, and we think about uh, being inopportune, right? So just putting it out there one time, Lord, you know, here's a Hail Mary, throw it up there, <laughs> you do with it what you will. Um, no, that's neither effectual or fervent. Okay? And the righteous part of it means you come to God having dealt with your stuff, right? You want to make sure that we've, we've confessed up our sins and we're keeping short accounts with God so that our prayers don't just hit the ceiling and bounce right back down, right? We want them, we want to go up to the heavenly places. We want our prayers to be heard Amen. in the throne room of God uh, because that's how they will be effectual, right? So... Um, and we're, we're to keep asking, right? Because God is working on us as we pray. And so just like uh, in the Bible, there's the story of the inopportune widow. Um, she keeps waking up the judge at night. You know, hey, you got any money? No, I don't have any money, but I was wronged. And you're the judge and it's your job to make it right. Go away. I don't feel like doing it. But, you know, after about five or six times of that, he was like, okay, I, you know, I, I guess I'll do it, right? I'll go ahead and do my job as a judge, even though she doesn't have any money, because I know she's just going to keep bothering me. So then how much more will the great judge and lawgiver respond to his children versus the ju judges here on earth who are subject to sin? All right. Now, as I've already mentioned, another reason we ought to pray is that God uses prayer to change us, Okay. So we pray because Jesus prayed, and we, we want to be like him. We want to be conformed to Christ, and prayer is one of the ways that God does this, right? He teaches us to pray, so he expects us to pray. Uh, the Puritans had a saying, when God gets ready to bless his people, he sets them to pray. Amen. Now, all of the great revivals in history, um, just recently uh, looked at a documentary uh, very well done on revivals, uh, and that, that was, that's what happened. There was fervent prayer amongst God's people. May have only been two, right? Meeting regularly, um, consistently, fervent, effectual prayer for revival, and then God would bless that, and you would have you know, hundreds and thousands of conversions, and it would last a season, and then the prayers would taper off, and God was done with that. And then somewhere else, those fervent prayers would go up again. And guess what? God would use that, and he would answer that in his providence, in his time. So when God gets ready to bless his people, he sets them to pray, right? And nothing gets his people praying like hard times, right? It just, you know, it turns out that that's the way it goes. For some reason, prosperity does not <laughs> tend to lead to us praying. 
Now, God can use prayer um, to change us even when he says no, okay? 2 Corinthians uh, 12, um, Paul is saying uh, that he was given that thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure, right? So God, and Paul's praying for it to be removed, and God says no, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's, gonna, he's got a purpose for Paul. And whatever that was, um, whether it was an eye condition or something, some physical um, disability uh, that God was using to keep Paul right where he wanted him, doing exactly what he wanted him to do, the way he wanted him to do it. And so um, Paul is asking for this, this thing, I besought the Lord three times, thrice, that it might depart from me. And God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness, right? Um, so the thing about prayer is when we pray, we, we want to know, um, or God wants us to know when he answers it, right? That it wasn't of some human effort, right? It wasn't anything we did to sort of convince him to paint God into a corner where, I guess you're just going to have to bless me now. <laughs> Uh, God answers prayers in a way that we can only say, well, that was God. Amen. Uh, that was him. And so only he gets that glory. Nobody and nothing in creation will get that glory. It belongs to him alone. So that's what he's talking about. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Right? God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so Paul's response to that was gladness, and I'd rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Right? Amen. Whatever else happens, I just want Jesus, right? And that's the focus of his prayers. They're, his prayers are saturated with God's will, right? Remember the, the, those faithful prayers. Faith is that dependence on God's grace and desiring his glory. So that's God changing us through the no answers, but he can also change us uh, through yes answers. Um, John chapter 12, uh, verses 27 to 32. Uh, Jesus is saying, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that and said it had thundered. Others said an angel spoke uh, to him. But Jesus answered and said, that voice came not, not because of me, but for your sakes. Mm -hmm. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, right? So this is a yes answer. Jesus is praying. Uh, now he's letting God know his condition. My soul is troubled. Uh, but he said, ask the Father, glorify thy name. And immediately God says, I sure will. I have glorified it and I'm <laughs> going to do it again. And he's going to keep doing it through the cross of Christ. All right. And there are other examples uh, that we could see of that. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 uh, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were afar off, were made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. Right, so Christ's prayers are answered and that we are all unified in one body. And so we have that access. Prayer is the access uh, to the throne. Uh, Jesus prayed again. He prayed for us in uh, John 17. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Right. So through the apostles preaching uh, their writings. So. Jesus, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you have professed Christ as Lord, Jesus was praying for you in John chapter 17. Amen. And he prayed this, 
that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Right? There is no separating the Christian from the love of God in Christ. Amen. You cannot be separated from that ever. And so that prayer was for us, and that prayer was answered. Right? In Romans, Paul expands that idea. Now, so sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes God answers wait. Right? Mm -hmm. And that waiting, uh, you see this at the end of uh, the book of the Revelation. And I'll just, I'll just turn there and read that. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Even, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's a prayer. That's a petition. And, and God says, wait. Right? In the waiting is the Christian life here on earth. Amen. Right? What I call the grace, the ordinary grace of the ordinary Christian life, which is nothing short of extraordinary. Right? When a Christian lives the plain, ordinary Christian life, Right? What is that? Right? It's loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Right? It's being obedient to the commands of God, and those are the two greatest ones. If you got those, you've got, you've got them all covered. And, and in order for us to do that, we can't do it in and of ourselves. We must, it must be the power of the Holy Spirit in Christ, God working through us, that sanctification. So that's what's happening in the waiting. That's why God will answer, wait, right? Uh, we've, we've kind of bounced this idea around before. You know, when, when we're saved, why doesn't God just teleport us on out of here, right? Why does he leave us here? Why do we wake up? We, the, the night we were converted, we went to bed, we fell asleep, and we woke up the next day, and we've been doing it over and over again ever <laughs> since, right? Because God has got a work. To do right, Amen. he works through. He works on this earth. He works his plan with his people. We are the instruments in the hands of the redeemer. Okay, and so in sanctification, God wants to change us from saying "My will be done," right, selfish desires, to "Thy will be done." What does God want? So, Lord, whatever you want, that that's what I want, right? Even if it's inconvenient and uncomfortable. And costly, um, and and God is, and, and that's not something we do naturally, right? That's why that's why we need a new heart. That's why we need to be redeemed. That's why we need to be saved. So we need a redeemer. We need a savior. We need Christ. That's why Christ came, and it's a process, right? Amen. Why why didn't why didn't God just you know shut the Bible down uh, after Genesis chapter three? Right? Because it's a process. Right? He's been working, he's been telling his story, he's been demonstrating this to the human race um, so that, that we will know there's nothing in us. It's Christ has always been the focus from the beginning of time. Amen. And God is working through our prayers, through the prayers of his people, directed toward him. Okay, So prayer is this great expression of communion with our creator and to conduct business with the almighty God is a very powerful means of grace, all right? Um, it, it is an inestimable privilege. Um, Spurgeon said, a prayerless soul is a Christless soul. Amen. So we, we need to make prayer a priority. Matthew Henry said, those who live without prayer in this world live without God in this world. Amen. And that is no, that is no position for the Christian to be in. Martin Lloyd-Jones, another quote from him, the one urge that the Christian should never resist is the urge to pray. Amen. We've, all, we've all experienced that, right? There's just something that says, I need to pray for this person, for this situation, and I need to do it right now, okay? And of course, we should pray because God commands us to pray. Uh, we're to be obedient to his every word, um, because to be obedient to his commands is to have love for God, right? If, if you want to be Jesus' 
uh, friend, you got to do what he says, right? If you want to love God, you want to demonstrate that, um, then then you do what he says, right? He he tells them in the Old Testament, I don't I don't want your barbecue. I want you to do what I said, right? <laughs> I want you to love me with all your heart, mind, Amen. soul, and strength, and I want you to love your neighbor. Exhibit that faith, hope, love uh, to others. So, and if God commands us to do something, what's our natural response? Well, we get our dander up and the feathers ruffle, and we don't we don't want to do it, right? We resist. Uh, some somebody else being in authority over us. We've been doing it since the Garden of Eden, and so that's that is the response that humanity gives. You know, what, who's God think He is expecting something of me? Well, He's He's God. He, he gets to. That's, Amen. that's part of being God, and His word is true, good, and beautiful. Uh, and so, really, the only reasonable response to His word, to His commands, is a cheerful, loving obedience. Okay. Um, and there's the expectation to pray. It doesn't say if you pray. It says when you pray, Amen. right? And, and he tells us to ask, seek, and knock, all right? So what about the who and the whom of prayer? So some questions that come up um, in um, the Baptist or the Westminster catechisms. Um, are we to pray unto God only, right? So think, think about that and how you would answer that. I'm not, I'm not going to go into the proof texts, um, but there are proof texts for this. <coughs> so are we to pray unto God only? Here's the answer. God only, being able to search the hearts, hear the requests, pardon the sins, and fulfill the desires of all, and only to be believed in and worshipped with religious worship, prayer, which is a special part of worship, is to be made by all to God alone and to none other. So we pray, we know we pray in Jesus' name. So what does that mean to pray in the name of Jesus Christ? Well, first off, it's an obedience to his command. He told us that's how we were to pray. And we pray in obedience to his command and in confidence of his promises to ask mercy for his sake, not by bare mentioning of his name, but actually drawing our encouragement to pray and our boldness and strength and hope that our prayers will be accepted. We draw that from Christ because uh, and his mediation, because he is our mediator. So why do we do that? Well, the sinfulness of man and our distance from God being so great is that we can have no access into God's presence without a mediator, without Christ, and there being none in heaven or earth appointed to or fit for that glorious work, but Christ alone. And so we're to pray in no other name but his only. Right? Amen. Uh, whom? Whom do we pray for? For whom do we pray? Rather? We're to pray for the whole church of Christ upon earth, for magistrates and ministers. Remember the verse about pray for kings and princes. All right, We should be doing that on a regular basis. Okay? Right. Not just when we turn on Fox News and hear what somebody said. <laughs> We're to be praying. We should be proactive and not reactive. Amen. Okay? Uh, God had a plan before the foundation of the earth. Uh, we have the, uh, the blueprints of his plan. He's revealed it to us. And so we, we know what this is about, right? We know what the standard is. And so we should be praying, uh, especially for those in leadership, uh, to, to submit to the authority of Christ, the king. Amen. Um, so we pray for magistrates and we pray for ministers, right? Especially ministers so pastors pastors and their and their family right because they're all part of that ministry missionaries those who are out preaching the gospel doing the work of an evangelist they need Amen. our prayers we pray for ourselves we pray for our brethren and yes we even pray for our enemies right we pray for all sorts of men living um, that they would come to know um, the saving power of the gospel right um, so who prayed in the Bible, right? You want some good examples of prayer? Well, Adam, Enoch, and Noah, they walked with God. Right? Right. So what, what were they doing? They were conversing with God. They were in a relationship, fellowship with him. And so that was a form of prayer, right? Um, we know that King David prayed, right? How, how do we know that he prayed? 
wrote the prayer book, <laughs> right? The book of Psalms. So those are, that's just an entire book of prayers. So yes, some were set to music, uh, but that's how they did it, right? That's how it's done. So prayers, hymns, spiritual songs, right? They all go together. Um, another good example of prayer, especially fervent prayer, is Elijah in 1 Kings 18. You break that down, and Elijah's saying, Lord, answer so that you can be glorified. Right? We've already talked about how important that is, and that's what prayer is all about. Lord, answer me so that my relationship with you will be affirmed. Right? So Elijah was expressing that dependence on God, depending on his grace, desiring his glory. And answer this prayer so that the people's hearts will be turned back to you. All right, so that's, that's effectual, fervent prayer. Jeremiah, in chapter 32, he's recognizing God's wonderful works. And then he's informing God of the situation. Right, God really didn't need the information, but he <laughs> needed Jeremiah to know and to, and to communicate that. Uh, and and Jeremiah is you know, reminding God of what God has said and what God has done. Again, God didn't need reminding, but he needs us to know, right? He needs us to be in the word. He needs us to be familiar with what he's doing and his plans. We saw that again in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Mary's Magnificent, as well as the praise, of the, the prayerful praise that Simeon and Anna give. Obviously, the prayer life of Jesus, that's a whole study in and of itself. Okay, so that's for like a future, Lord will in a future uh, time. Amen. And then Paul, right, in, in his epistles, um, you know, well, in the book of Acts, they're getting together as a community, they're praying together, um, but also Paul, as he's writing his epistles, he's including prayers, right? Uh, I pray, he doesn't just say, I pray for you, pray for you, brother. Uh, you Corinthians, praying for you guys. Um, that's not what he does, right? He's very specific about what he's praying for, right? And often involves the grace and the peace of God and how that, that would be manifested in their lives. And Paul, and the reason Paul can do that is because he knows the Corinthians. He's Amen. been there living with them, uh, communicating with them. That's why, you know, we should be in community with one another. We should have that quantity of fellowship. We should know what's happening in each other's lives so that it's not vague, generic prayers, but it's specific, right? It's hard to be effectual and fervent when it's generic and vague. Right? Right. That's, that's a difficult thing to do. And so, um, you know, we're, we're going to be much more effective in our prayers for one another when we're, we're living in that community. Uh, when we're keeping short accounts with God, but also with one another, uh, as opposed to, you know, somebody in Timbuktu somewhere that we heard from a herd from a Facebook post and Amen. You know, something like that. That's, that's just the way it goes. Um, God, God did not design us to be disconnected from Amen. him or to be disconnected from one another, right? So it's one body united, okay? Um, all right, so... We'll, we'll do a little bit more about when to pray, okay? Matthew chapter 6, uh, Jesus is saying, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say to you that they have their reward. But thou, talking to his disciples, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, right, there's that expectation, right, not if, but when ye pray, uh, use not the vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Right? Again, that's that generic prayer. Right? I've got a mantra, I'm just going to say that over and over again, or you know, just make a noise, a racket, on you know, to the great whatever <laughs> tune court in the sky. We don't do that. We pray to the living God, and, and he wants an intimate relationship with us, right? So, um, so don't be like the heathen, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. 
So isn't that something? He knows what we need. He already knows. And what's the command? Pray. Amen. Tell me. Ask me. Right? You have not because you ask not. Amen. That's what the Father commands. And then he said, after this manner, therefore, pray. All right? Um, so, so, when do we pray? Okay? Well, we pray in the morning. Psalm 5, 3, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Uh, day and night we pray. Psalm 88, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. That is a prayer. Amen. Um, Leviticus, right, and, and, um, uh, and the Levites, they uh, offered incense offerings. This was a form of prayer. Uh, they, they did it twice a day. Um, we see that in Exodus chapter 30. And Aaron shall burn their own sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. When Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Um, we don't need incense, right? Christians don't need incense. Amen. Why? Because we already smell good to God. We don't have to cover up our smell. Because we don't stink. When we confess our sins and come before God in Jesus' name, he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. Amen. We're clean, right? That's the Christian's bar of soap. We don't need incense. We don't stink. We don't smell to God. Does that make you feel better? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Just, just a pro tip. <laughs> Psalm 55, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and, she, and he shall hear my voice. Evening, morning, noon. Okay, that's three times a day. You can pray all night long. And it came to pass in those days, in Luke 6, that he went out into a mountain to pray, and Jesus continued all night in prayer to God. Um, so what's the real answer? Well, all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. 1 Thessalonians 5, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Um, in Ephesians 6, um, that's, that's the armor of God. Think about the armor of God passages. All right? What's armor for? Armor's for battle. Okay, All the armor of God is all on the front, so we're offensive. Okay, And if you read that passage, I'm not, I'm not going to read that. Um, but, but in that passage, um, prayer is not the armor, and prayer is not the sword, but instead it is the heavy artillery of the Christian spiritual warfare. Amen. Right? So if you're not praying, you're just leaving uh, the heavy guns at home. We don't want to do that. Right? We want to pack them, load them, fire them at the enemy, keep them running day and night. And uh, Jesus said in Luke 18, he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint. Okay? Um, and where are we to pray? Well, here's an easier one to answer. Where should we not pray? Right? Matthew 6, we, we read it. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. So we don't get to pray out loud on the street corner where just so everybody can see us. That's right. Do we get to pray on the street corner? Uh-huh. <laughs> we just got to do it so for so men not to see us. Amen. Right? So we, uh, we, we don't, uh, we're not trying to get glory from men. We're trying to be instruments of God to glorify him. And then yeah. obviously, and he goes on to say, uh, Matthew 6, 6. Uh, but when we pray, we're to enter thy closet um, to pray. And so as you know, as the rest of society is trying to tell people to come out of the closet, and the Lord of heaven is saying, get in your closet. <laughs> Amen. Um, God has an interesting sense of humor. Amen. All right. So I hope, you, uh, I hope this benefits you. I hope your, your uh, Christmas shopping, your giving, your celebrating... Uh, we'll all be saturated in prayer uh, this season and uh, as we go into the new year. Any questions, reflections?